We have about 15 minutes for questions and lots of them. Um, a lot of them are bunched around um, external uh, neighborly influence. We had a panelist in our last panel who announced that Kuwait would be participating in the Iraq election. Um, <laughs> let me ask uh, both Mr. Tobbins and, and Ren, uh, your assessment of uh, outside interference, um, what makes you think that Syria will interfere in Iraq on behalf of the Sunnis is one questioner asks, and about Turkey's role after the U.S. withdrawal. Well, I, I think um, Iran's behavior is likely to be more a function of its relations with the United States than uh, its interest in uh, Iraq. Its interest in Iraq are not inconsistent with those of the United States, or for that matter, inconsistent with those of Iraq. It wants a unified Iraq, albeit not a particularly strong or challenging Iraq. That's what it has um, uh, at the moment. Um, and there's no particular reason to destabilize it unless it was, uh, 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 unless Iran decides to do so for reasons that revolve around their relations with the U.S. A and so, um, uh, the degree to which um, tensions with the U.S. Uh, increase over extraneous issues, the nuclear issue being the principal one likely to in, uh, intensify uh, conflict, um, will be the most important determinant of Iranian behavior over the next uh, few years uh, as it relates to, um, uh, to, uh, to Iraq. In, in terms of tur uh, Turkey, it will be um, the behavior of the Kurds both on the PKK and also on the border region and the minorities in the border region that would be um, most likely to provoke some kind of intervention. Um, so I, I think those are the dangers. They're not uh, insurmountable, and it's not inevitable uh, that there will be uh, intolerable levels of interference, but it's certainly possible. Brent? Yeah, I would differ with that slightly because I think a lot has to do with the way that Iran and Turkey see themselves in the region. In other words, the way they define their role in the region. I don't think that, for example, for Turkey, the only issue in Iraq is the Kurds. It used to be at a certain point, but we've seen Turkey evolve politically. And, and, and we've seen it redefine its, its regional role. And I think, therefore, its relationship with Iraq will transcend or go beyond its interest in the Kurds. Similarly, Iran sees a role for itself in the region that is not only connected with the US, much broader. And so they will continue to have an interest in Iraq uh, beyond the narrower interest. And by the way, I mean, um, those who know history know that uh, Iraq and Baghdad in particular was throughout the um, 16th and 17th century subject to uh, waves of invasions, successive invasions from Persia at one time, Turkey on the other, at, at the other time, and it would change hands all the time. Um, the, the other thing to point out on, in all of this is that because in the, over the last several years, w uh, since 2003, Iraq has not clearly defined itself as an Arab state, for example. But not that I'm suggesting it needs to, but, at, but in the past there was always a host, there was always a context for Iraq, which was the Arab world. And that tended to slightly sort of ease off possibly Iranian pressure or Turkish pressure and so on. But now Iraq does not necessarily uh, recognize its Arabness and its uh, belonging to an Arab world, and that makes the regional uh, influences and, and agendas much more, much sharper. They come into much sharper focus. Uh, there's a series of questions on the issue of corruption. I'd like to ask both Michael Corbin and, and Ali Alawi. Um, Transparency International has named Iraq third from the bottom. Um, but it's also endemic. It's you want a passport, it's $300 to the guy behind the desk. Uh, it's not just institutional, it is across the board. Um, I wondered if both of you can speak to um, the, the, you generally said it was an issue of free press and, and the judiciary. Um, uh, how long do we wait for that and is it already in place? 
before that happens. Just quickly, it's, it's about a free press that's willing to um, publicize these cases, it's about a judiciary that's willing to present cases about them, and it's about a government that's willing to actually prosecute them. This is where I, I think that institutions in Iraq are developing. The Council of Representatives is taking on its role of calling ministers who, were who are accused of corruption. There's lots more to do. Um, Iraq has a tradition of a fairly independent judiciary. I think there's a basis to work with there. I think this will be a focus that uh, we have to work on, and I think Iraq may be ahead of some other countries in the region in terms of what we have to work with to address this issue. Ali Alawi? Uh, I'm afraid I slightly disagree because I think corruption in Iraq is, is really institutionalized in the sense that it's part and parcel of whatever you want to do with the government. The, f the fact of the matter is that a lot of the, especially the larger cases of corruption, were exposed by the press. A lot of the uh, actors were known, but there was neither a political will to bring them to, to task, nor might I add, and the international environment that helped or that supported the Iraqi desire to bring these people to, to justice. The, the scale of corruption in some of the ministries really goes beyond the normal 5% or whatever it is that people charge in commissions. It, it, it goes into theft of, of state assets and entire budgets. And to some extent, this is so interwoven with the uh, political parties and with the power structures that it's very, very difficult, I think, except when the thing becomes so obvious and so uh, immediately tangible uh, as what happened in the case of the corruption in the Ministry of Trade. It, was, it is institutionalized because in the past, although the state was corrupt in the Saddam period, it basically managed the corruption. And there was a very powerful force called the security forces, which if people uh, did not toe the line as to how much they could take, they were sanctioned. This is gone. Uh, and the various institutions that manage the, the uh, process of uncovering corrupt practices and so on are themselves infiltrated and subverted. And the government constantly uh, changes tax as to how to uh, manage and to uh, go after uh, uh, those who indulge in these practices. So I think it will stay with us for, for some time to come. Let me ask the panel in general, um, is there a place for high-ranking Ba'athist members of the former regime, such as diplomats or ministers not accused of human rights abuses, to take part in politics? I suppose we should start with the two Iraqis. Well, um, there, there are two levels of, uh, to this. First of all, in the Constitution, the Ba'ath Party is banned. So I think that somebody who's running uh, under the banner of the Ba'ath Party would not be able to run for anything. Um, but the other, the other uh, part of it is that the debathification law has been replaced by the uh, accountability and whatever, amnesty, amnesty and accountability. And uh, I believe in it, the, the people who have not committed crimes can participate in government. I think above a certain rank they can't, but they can retire, they, they can be pensioned off. Below a certain rank, and that rank is fairly high, they can participate in anything they wish. Now, that is the sort of de jure uh, part of it, but in, in fact, uh, I think the Baathis are still regarded, even if they were low ranking and so on, they're still regarded as very suspect. They are, uh, I'm sure that they would be hounded out of office, uh, out of their jobs. So the reality, the laws and the reality don't necessarily match. Uh, 